Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first webinar in our winter webinar series. My name is Mary Brown, and I'm the guide manager here at Alpine Ascent International. I'm pretty behind the scenes working with our excellent guide staff, but you may interact with me if you sign up for any of our She Jumps, Collabs, Climbs, or courses. Shout out to She Jumps, we love you so much. You want to request a guide for your climb or course, or you're applying to be a guide. On this very rainy Thursday, I'm streaming in from our world headquarters on the unceded traditional lands of the Coast Salish people, including the Duwamish people past and present. This acknowledgement does not take the place of authentic relationships with indigenous communities, but serves as the first step in honoring the land that we are on. While I'm introducing our esteemed speaker today, please drop your name in the chat, where you're joining from, and your favorite backcountry snack. Today, we'll be learning from Alpine Ascent's lead guide and the visionary behind Mountain Talk, Brooke Warren. Brooke Warren is originally from Colorado and grew up skiing, climbing, and gallivanting around the mountains of her hometown of Crested Butte. She has climbed extensively in the U.S. in spots like Indian Creek, Bidavu, North Cascades, and internationally in Chile, Mexico, Peru, Canada, and Afghanistan. She loves introducing new skills to skiers and climbers, as well as helping people develop their mountain craft with larger goals in mind. She guides in Washington, Alaska, and Colorado on objectives ranging from Denali expeditions to single day backcountry skiing and rock climbing trips. She has a background in outdoor education, working for Outward Bound, as well as other experiential learning institutions. Before I turn this webinar over to Brooke, just a couple of housekeeping notes. If you have any questions at all during the webinar, just pop them in the Q&A box, which is kind of at the bottom of your screen, and we'll circle back to them at the end of the webinar. I'm going to turn off my camera in a second, so I'm not staring at my face for the whole presentation, but I'll be in the chat dropping in links and helpful tips throughout the presentation. So without further ado, Brooke, over to you. Thank you so much for the awesome introduction, Mary. Um, so I'm super excited to be sharing these tips and tricks with you all today. Uh, like she said, I have been super fortunate to have spent my personal and professional life in the mountains, both skiing, backpacking, rock climbing, and mountaineering. And along the way, I've had to experiment and learn how to be comfortable as a woman in the mountains. And I can safely say that figuring out all of these self-care tips and tricks have made it a lot more successful for me to summit and to actually do the climbing that I'm att attempting to do out there. Um, and so I wanted to share all of these tips and tricks with you all so that you don't have to start from square one. And I'm gonna go ahead and switch over to sharing my screen in just a moment. Um, and then we'll get started. One moment, slideshow. Whoops. Got to go to the top here. There we go. Slideshow. Okay, so as you may or may not know, throughout history, women have been a minority um, in terms of climbers out there. And it's also a trend just in outdoor sports in general. And fortunately that has back gradually been evening out throughout time, um, but it's still fairly common for women to find themselves as either like the sole, um, the sole female in a group or maybe having to learn skills from male, mount, male counterparts. Um, fortunately, let Alpine Ascents and a lot of other organizations are providing more and more women specific trips so that we can learn from other women. And it's important because we do encounter a lot of challenges out there um, that are different than what men encounter, um, specifically regarding our female anatomy in terms of peeing or maybe, but also in terms of the way that our bodies are made up um, and maybe we have to carry more weight, body weight percentage on our backs. Um, plus there's also emotional difficulties that arise when we're a minority in a group. And we're gonna try to address all of these things today. So, before we get st totally started, um, here's a list of the things that we're going to cover today. And at the end, we're going to have an opportunity for some questions. Um, and I want to say that this information should be helpful to anyone and everyone, not just women. Um, although it's very specific to female anatomy in a lot of cases, um, it's also helpful for our male mountain partners. Um, I even had a male guide ask if he could join in today because he wants to learn how he can better support his female clients. So that's super awesome. Um, so basically it's applicable to anybody interested in mountaineering. 
And then finally, a lot of the information is very specific to glaciated mountaineering, but it can also apply to maybe backpacking or rock climbing or anything else in the backcountry. Um, and hopefully you'll find some tidbits of information, whether you're a novice or have a lot of experience out there. So first things first, as you may know, um, at Alpine Ascents, we guide a lot of trips on glaciated peaks. And I just wanted to go over some of the expectations that um, you might need to have to go on a trip like that. So first of all, um, pacing. We generally go at about a thousand feet per hour, give or take, depending on altitude or a variety of other factors, once we're ascending the mountain. That means we're going 1000 feet up in elevation per hour. We also try to move about an hour at a time and then take 10 to 15 minute maintenance breaks in between. And those are for peeing, eating, drinking, changing layers, et cetera. And also we like to move at a steady and consistent pace. Oftentimes we're on, when we're on glaciers, we're roped together. And so if we do um, the scurry and stop habit, then it's a lot harder to move together. And so we wanna move steadily and consistently. And even if you're doing your own trip, um, trying to find a pace that is steady and consistent can actually help you be, have more endurance. Next, we'll talk about some privacy elements. So oftentimes when we're moving on a mountain, we're gonna be on an open and snowy glacier. Um, and there's just not much stuff to hide behind there. So there's no trees, no rocks to go pee behind or anything like that. You're often gonna be roped together with people if you do need to take a pee break. Um, additionally, at camps, there's usually not a, per, a sheltered bathroom per se, um, though on a, some of our international trips and like places like Camp Muir, there is a bathroom shelter at base camp. Um, but often our camps are just having, they just have like a snowy privacy wall to hide behind when you do need to use the bathroom. Additionally, if you are on a guided trip, you'll probably be sharing a tent with somebody that you don't know. And you might even be sharing a tent with somebody who's not the same gender as you. Um, there's a lot of different ways that we can uh, deal with that. We can ask, ask our tent partner to leave if we need to change our clothes. And I've often found it really easy to just change my clothes inside my sleeping bag with it slightly unzipped. And we'll talk about some privacy in terms of peeing inside your tent if you need to do that as well. Uh, the mountains. Well, the mountains don't discriminate. They don't care whether you're male or female or whatever gender you are. They're going to be the same mountain no matter what, which is awesome. So as long as we train and we're able to um, move at a reasonable pace, we'll probably be successful. Um, temperatures can range from super high to super low. I've, in the same trip, worn um, my lowest base layers and felt like I was inside of a microwave as well as had to put every single layer on. And so it's important to like follow a gear list um, and that's gonna prepare you for your trip. And then additionally, we're gonna encounter a lot of different vari variability in terms of surfaces that we'll move on. Sometimes we'll move over rocks with our crampons on and sometimes we'll be post holing into snow up to our knees, hopefully not that often. And sometimes we'll even encounter that is really firm and we need the cramponing technique to move on it. Which brings us to your guides, which is they are there to teach you the skills to be able to move in the terrain that you're on. Um, and they will answer your questions when um, to make sure you know all the things you need to know when you know it. Um, additionally, I found it a lot easier if um, my guests on a trip uh, are aware of big group dynamics. When we're teaching a big group of people, it's really helpful for everybody to pay attention when the guide is speaking. Um, and I've noticed that um, uh, with these big group dynamics, it can be hard to wrangle people. So some of the things that you can do if you are a guest on one of our trips is to just be there and ready to learn when it's time. And then finally, trust the decisions of your guides. They are ultimately there to manage risk. And so as long as you trust those decisions in terms of risk management, you will have a quite a successful trip. Uh, hey, Mary, I believe that your uh, audio is not muted. Do you want to go ahead and mute that? Okay, now we're going to go into the biggest topic of the day, which is peeing and privacy. Um, I have this belief that part of the reason that there are fewer female alpinists out there in the world is because it is very tricky to pee while you're in a harness, especially with a lot of gear on your harness. But this picture here is proof that it's possible. This is me going pee on the side of Forbidden Peak out in the North Cascades. 
and um, I am attached to a rope on the side of a cliff, wearing my harness and still going pee. So I believe that it's possible for you as well. And we're gonna talk about how. So the first thing is you're gonna want to find, uh, to, you're gonna wanna practice and learn how to squat. So if you don't have the type of flexibility that allows you to squat, you can always practice that, um, but it's gonna make it a lot easier for you to go pee out there in the back country. Um, oops. So here are some different ways that you can squat. The first uh, uh, picture on the far left um, is a, a less flexible way to squat, and that's perfectly uh, appropriate. I do find if you're squatting in this position that it's harder on the quad muscles. And so I actually prefer to squat in the picture that is demonstrated in the middle, which is basically resting on one of your heels. It may look like you might pee on your foot, but I promise you don't if you do it right. Um, you can even practice this in the bathroom, like in the shower or something, if you need, if you're worried. Um, and then there's also the deep squat that the picture on the right is demonstrating. And that's a great way to squat as well. But note that if you are squatting like that to go pee and you're facing your group of, and you're facing your teammates, everything will be exposed. And so that's why I actually suggest this middle version where you're squatting on your heel, because you can use your knee to kind of put in front of your body to hide any of your body parts from your team members. Additionally, there's other ways we can find some privacy when we're going peeing on a snowy slope, which you can put your backpack in front of yourself and that can help um, hide yourself from the rest of the group. Uh, it can also serve as a way to support yourself. And then finally, you actually do want to face the group for privacy. You can imagine that if she were, um, going pee and having to pull all of her pants down, you'd have a full moon. Um, and that's no good. So I actually choose to face danger or face the group in order to be able to um, cover up my body parts. And also another great tool is when you're on a slope, generally people will sit facing downhill. And so if you go uphill of your group, then you're also likely to have more privacy. Again, nobody wants to watch you pee. So you can always say, hey, everybody, can you look at this look the other way, I need to go pee really quick, and everybody will usually want to help you out. So we're also often, we have our, we are roped together on a rope team, we have our harnesses on, and it would be unsafe to take our harnesses off to go to the bathroom. And so here's a quick video of how to go pee. It's pretty easy, just unzip, pull down your pants, and then those two elastic straps in the back, you'll pull to the side, do your duty, shake it off or wipe, and then pull your pants back up. Sometimes it can be a little bit more tedious with more layers on, but that's essentially what, what it will look like. Next, we're gonna talk about pee funnels. So some qualities to look for, uh, well, first of all, why would you use a pee funnel? Well, there's a couple different reasons you'd use one. One, maybe it's super snowy and cold and windy out there and you don't wanna pull your pants down to go to the bathroom. Also, some people just prefer to use pee funnels in general because it offers you a little bit more privacy. And then uh, finally, it can be a really great tool for peeing into a pee bottle, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But some qualities to look for in pee funnels that are gonna work for mountaineering is you're gonna want them to be rigid. I've X'd out the pee funnels here that are not rigid. They're either made out of silicone or paper or something. The reason why you don't those is because they are hard time getting up and over the layers of your clothing. And so they can actually backwash into your pants. Um, the next quality is to look for something that's a funnel shape. The one that I've X'd out here is actually more of a trough shape. And that's not great because sometimes if your pee comes out very quickly, it can backsplash on you. And again, um, it just, if there's a, a lot of stream all at once, it, it might overflow. And so that's no good either. Another quality is it needs to be easy to place. I've X'd out this one here because it has a very small hole that you need to aim into. Unless you know your anatomy really well, it's gonna be hard to get that placed in the right uh, area. And so the two that are left here are actually funnel shapes. It's the, both the shiwi, uh, which is the blue one at the bottom and the freshette, which is the green one in the middle there. Um, and they're funnel shapes, they're quite large areas, they'll fit right over your anatomy. They're funnels, so your pee won't flow out 
of them and that are going to push down your, um, your layers and actually be able to get over those things. They also come with a tube. Um, this is the freshette. They come with a tube that can help you direct your stream, which is super awesome. And Mary, can you please put the uh, link to the freshette there in the chat? Um, if you do need to get a P-Funnel, this is the one that I most recommend. All right, so the next thing is you're going to want to practice with your P-Funnel. Um, the place that I would practice first is use it in the shower without clothes on, just so that you can practice actually letting yourself pee while standing. What can be really interesting is we're, we've all learned how to pee while sitting down. And um, if you, and so our muscles have a hard time being like, yes, it is okay to pee while you're standing up. So that's one thing that you have to practice. You also need to practice getting it in the right place and making sure there's no leakage. You can also practice aiming into a toilet bowl, bowl maybe move the bath mat to the side so you don't have any drips. Um, and then once you've practiced, then you can get really good at it um, and be more confident with using that tool. Additionally, one thing to note is with the P-Funnel, um, if you are wearing clothes while using it, uh, you don't really have as much of an opportunity to wipe. So when you remove it, you kind of have to kind of scrape it out so that you catch any extra drops that are there. Oops. And then finally, pee bottles. So pee bottles, why would we use them? Well, we usually use them in a side of our tents if we don't want to get out um, to go pee outside. This could happen if it's super gnarly weather outside, or it could happen if we're in the middle of the night, we don't want to disturb our tent mate, or we don't want to have to take the whole time to get out of our sleeping bag, put our layers on, put our boots on, go outside, come back, put our, take our boots back off, take our layers off and get back in our sleeping bag. That's a big pain in the butt. So a better reason, a better way to do this is to just have a pee bottle. Um, and Mary, if you can put the link to the, to the soft pee bottle. Um, this is a hard Nalgene bottle. I actually usually prefer a soft Nalgene bottle to pee in. Um, they can come in like liter and a half sizes in case you need to pee a lot during the night. Um, but basically it's a great way to store your pee and not have to get out of your tent. You can do this by using your pee funnel to direct your stream directly into the bottle, or you can do a direct deposit, which basically means taking the wide mouth of the bottle and putting it directly up against your anatomy and then peeing directly into it. Um, in both cases, I find it easiest to be kneeling while doing this. Um, you can either kneel on one knee or kneel on both knees, like demonstrated in these photos. And if you need some more privacy, you can always like put your sleeping bag over your shoulders or something so that any tent mates can't see you. Next, we're going to talk about hygiene. One thing to note is in this photo here, don't worry, she's not actually pooping, she's pretending. Um, but this is a great example of some of the uh, the pee holes that we share on the mountain in the snow. So we all use the same pee hole, a privy or a, uh, a bathroom area. And sometimes those pee holes get really wide because pee is hot. And so it melts the snow away. Um, so you have to practice kind of straddling over the pee hole sometimes if they do get big. Um, but basically we're going to talk about what we can wipe with. And we're talking specifically about peeing. Um, please never wipe with snow. That would be unsanitary and it would get... Uh, potentially get bacteria into the water source. So you can wipe your pee with snow though. Um, that's a great tool. I find it quite refreshing actually. Um, and it's quite clean as well. Um, you could also use a Kula cloth. These are antimicrobial uh, cloths that are basically just used for pee. Then you put them on the outside of your backpack and the UV ray of the sun kind of actually helps disinfect it. You still do have to wash them though. Um, you can also drip dry. I just prefer to wipe with something because if I'm dripping dry for every single time I go pee, um, there's always a little bit left and then it kind of makes my pants stink after a while. And then finally, you can use TP or wet wipes to wipe with. Um, and this is great. The one thing you do have to note is that you need to bring an extra bag that you can put the waste in if you're going to be using TP or wet wipes. And the reason why is we are ne never going to bury this stuff in the backcountry. We always want to pack out our waste. Um, some hyg hygiene uh, problems that we can run into out there are urinary tract infections and yeast infections. Um, some some symptoms of that are that you might be peeing often and not much pee comes out when you are peeing, it might be burning. And then yeast infections are more itchy. Um, here's a photo here or a video here of me taking some wet wipes 
and putting them into a separate plastic bag. You never want to take the whole uh, box of wet wipes with you. Only need to bring whatever three or four, or how many days your trip is for, um, for dealing with either wiping or for hygiene to prevent some of these infections. Uh, some other remedies or preventative methods for urinary tract infections or yeast infections are changing your underwear often. Um, I usually wear the same pair of underwear for uh, two to three days, and then I change it. And I use usually use wool underwear or some sort of natural fiber um, because it's one less stinky and it also helps you breathe better. Hydrating often is helpful because it helps flush out your system. And then of course, like the previous video, a wet wipe a day keeps the UTI away. Um, we also as guides do carry um, UTI antibiotics. So if that were to become a problem, we can help you out with that. Um, that might also be something you want to carry in your backcountry first aid kit personally. Next, we're going to talk about periods. So first of all, you do want to keep track and plan ahead for your period. Um, Knowing if you're going to get your period during your trip is super helpful so that you show up with the right materials you're going to need. That said, your cycle might be disrupted during your trip. If you're doing something that is out of the ordinary for you, maybe you're exerting yourself a lot more than normal, you're around different people, your hormones change, and you could actually get your period when you're not expecting it, or maybe your period has uh, had a different flow than it normally is. So having materials to deal with your menstrual cycle is always helpful no matter what. I always carry, carry tampons in my first aid kit for the, that um, unexpected event. Um, finally, some of the different materials we use are tampons, pads, and cups. Um, I'm pretty sure that most of you all are pretty familiar with tampons and pads. Some of you may not be familiar with menstrual cups, but basically they are cups that you insert inside of yourself and it catches the blood and then you take it out and pour the blood out. Um, this can be super nice in the backcountry because you don't have to carry out the waste. Whereas if you're using tampons and pads, it's really important that you bring an extra bag to put that stuff in and carry out your waste. Um, I also like to use tampons, the OB tampons that don't have the plastic applicators because then it's just less stuff to carry out. Um, with the menstrual cups, um, they're really awesome because there's not any waste, but it can be really challenging to use them in backcountry settings where there's not a lot of snow. Um, and that's just because you do have to take it out and pour it out and clean it off and then put it back in and clean your hands off. And if you're in the dirt or something like that, or a forested area, it can be really challenging. But fortunately, if you're in a snowy area, I just pour it out and wipe it off in the snow and it gets it really clean. And then I stick it right back in and it's all good. Um, Next thing, uh, birth control. So please know that I am not a medical professional in terms of birth control. So and consult your doctor before making any birth control decisions. But I did wanna talk about some different um, things that people use. One, if you're doing some sort of hormonal pill, um, you can like take those, uh, the hormonal pill or maybe take the placebo pill at a different time to adjust your cycle, either planning ahead by months or planning ahead during your trip so that your cycle doesn't happen during your trip. That can be helpful. Um, and also there's different types of IUDs that are hormonal that can actually um, almost totally get rid of your period. Um, I used to have a copper IUD and it made my period really heavy. And I recently switched to a hormonal IUD and now I don't even get my period at all, which is super nice in the mountains, which is part of the reason that I did it because I was just tired of having my period out there. Um, but that said, even if you are going to have your period out in the mountains, you can do it. I've summited Denali while on my period. I have climbed a big wall while I'm, while I'm on my period. And so it's possible. Um, that said, everybody has different experiences. Is, so if you get really bad cramps or it's really debilitating for you, then um, it's important for you to talk to your backcountry partners about that and um find some other methods to deal with that and also have painkillers for cramps and stuff um, at, in your first aid kit to be able to deal with that. And then finally, where and when do we deal with our periods? Well, um, there's a funny video um, that I, I posted to the Alpine Ascents Instagram, which Mary can put in the links there, um, which is about how to use a wag bag. So a wag bag is basically the bag that we poop in out in the mountains to carry our waste out. And it's actually the best practice these days 
we don't in a lot of populated backcountry areas, we actually don't, it's not no longer best, best practice to bury your poop. Um, and so putting it, going poop in a wag bag is the best practice. Now, if you are going poop and you're on your period, that's a great time to either pour out your diva cup or change out your tampon or your pad. That said, sometimes we have to change those things more often than when we're going poop and that's okay. You can do it when you're going pee. Um, but if you do drip any blood specifically, if you're in like our, um, the pee hole that we all use together, you just use a shovel, shovel some fresh snow on top of it so that the blood isn't an eyesore for other people. And then same thing, if you're on the trail and you have to go pee, um, and you have to change out your tampons or whatever, same thing. If there's any blood dropped head and cover that up with some snow and it shouldn't be an eyesore for other people on the trail. All righty. The next thing is sizing clothes and gear. Um, so one of the main things to note here is that sometimes as women, one, we have either curvier bodies or maybe smaller bodies than men. And that can make it sometimes difficult to find gear that's going to work for us. That said, um, there's a ton of manufacturers that are making awesome women's gear out there. And um, so I feel like most, more often than not, you're going to be able to find something that's women specific that you're going to like on your body. Uh, but I just wanted to show this funny example here. Of, this is myself and one of uh, my colleagues. We're both wearing a men's small jacket and I look like a freaking Michelin man, but hey, it's doing the job. It's functional. It's keeping me warm. And that's what's most important. Which brings me to the fact of when we're out there in the backcountry, the most important thing is function over fashion. Sure, we do want to look good, so we feel good, and we perform well. But also, uh, you know, having super tight pants that show off our butts or whatever is not the main goal here. Um, fortunately, uh, the fashion industry has adopted some of the outdoor gear aesthetic, which is super awesome. Although I will admit that uh, the aesthetic that this model is demonstrating here is not quite that functional. <laughs> so to start off with jackets, um, you want your jackets to not be too tight and, but also not be too bulky. We're going to talk about this a little bit more later, but all of the jackets that you bring on a trip should be able to, should be able to be worn all together. So basically as you are in colder environments, you just put another jacket on and layer up. That means they need to work like a Russian doll and you can wear them all together. Um, Specifically, your outermost layer, your puffy layer, should not be too tight. You need to be able to move your arms, and it shouldn't be so bulky that you can't, that it also impedes your movement. This is a picture of myself and a guest who are, are also both wearing men's jackets on top of Denali. Um, in terms of men's jackets, men's sizing, uh, men's jackets are perfectly appropriate, but you should know a few things. One, they tend to have longer arms. So if your arms are not long, it's nice to have little um, either cinches, make sure there's Velcro or some sort of way to cinch it at the weight at the wrist. They also tend to be boxier, um, which means they have less space at the hips. So if you do have wide hips or you're curvier, it is nice to find a women's specific jacket because it will accommodate for that shape. Next, pants. Um, we are going to, again, look for comfort over tightness, comfort over um, fashion. Um, I know a lot of women do like to wear leggings instead of um, climbing pants, and that's perfectly appropriate on the approach, but I generally suggest that when you're actually climbing that you wear climbing pants. They tend to be more um, better at wicking moisture and also be a little bit more breathable. Um, um, thing I do like to find for comfort is that the pants are more high-waisted rather than low-waisted. And this just makes sure that it, that interface with your harness and that your, and your belt buckle of your backpack does, isn't uncomfortable. Another thing to note is that pants, as we may know, as we may all know as women, um, sometimes different brands have totally different sizing. So for example, I have bought wrap pants. I'm usually a size small in size small, and they were way too big. And then I bought a size extra small and they were still quite quite big on me. Um, but I've also worn Ortovox pants, which are a European brand um, that were I had to wear in a size medium. And so basically the point is try on the clothes that you're planning to wear in the backcountry so that you know that it's comfortable for you and it'll be functional. Boots. First of all, you're going to want to size up your boots um, for swelling. 
Generally, when you're at altitude or if you're on your feet for a long time, your feet tend to swell. And if your boots are too small or maybe your street shoe size, they might actually be um, more prone to giving you blisters. And this is specifically for like higher altitude trips and wearing double boots. Um, additionally, if you have small feet, it can be really challenging to find technical double boots. I have spent three years trying to find a pair of technical double boots that fit me um, because I have size six and a half feet. Um, fortunately, I have found uh, the brands Loa and Mie do make boots in smaller foot sizes that are like smaller than size 37. Uh, unfortunately, the leading industry brands, uh, La Sportiva and Scarpa in the U.S., don't make that many sizes that are smaller than 37. And if they do make any boots those sizes, they're just in a really small run, so it's hard to find. So if you are interested in finding boots that fit or, that fit your small feet, uh, look for Loa and Mie. And I there's a link for a Loa boot over here as well. Next, we're going to talk about packs. So. It's really important that you wear a pack that's the correct size for the job. I know that a lot of women that I work with um, complain about their pack being too heavy. And one way to avoid that is to just get a pack that's big enough to fit all your stuff. A great example here is that here I'm using a, a pack that is not big enough for the job. This was a, for a four day trip in the back country. And you can see it's totally overloaded. There's a bunch of jackets strapped to the outside. It doesn't look very svelte. Whereas this pack here is very svelte and everything fits inside of it. It's just because it's a bigger pack. Generally, if the pack is big enough to fit all the things that you need, it's gonna carry better on your body and it's gonna be more comfortable. And then also um, you're gonna wanna have a pack that fits your torso length. There's a link that Mary will add here to the REI page about how to fit a pack. But generally, if you go to buy a pack, there will be somebody there that can help you fit it to your torso. Um, the way that you're going to know if it's your torso length is that the shoulder straps actually lie directly over your shoulders, like this photo on the top. And the waist belt is actually around your waist, around your waist, not low on your hips. Um, and making sure that's the right torso length, again, is going to make it the pack carry better on your back and be made more comfortable. It'll feel like you're better able to carry those things. And then finally, harnesses. So most alpine harnesses, I believe, are unisex, but rock climbing harnesses do come with um, women's sizes. And that generally means that the, that the leg loops are larger in ratio compared to the waist loop than men's sizes. Um, but the main thing you want to find with an alpine harness is that you want to make sure it'll fit around your waist and over your layers. So you can see this is up over our layers here. Um, and even, you know, layers up to your shell jacket. Um, so if you're wearing all of your layers up to your shell jacket, it should still fit all over all those layers. So that means sometimes you have to size up in your, um, in your harness than you might expect. But basically the point is try it on, make sure it's going to fit over all your layers so that you're not going to find yourself fumbling to try to find your harness or your gear loop or your um, belay loop to try to clip in. We at Alpine Ascents do rent a bunch of items and you can find that on our gear lists for all the trips that we do. Um, we do have a lot of unisex rental items listed here, but most rentals do come in women's specific sizing. That said, if you are a woman and you do want like a men's sizing for some reason, um, that is totally appropriate as well. You just need to ask our gear staff for that. Next, we're going to talk about some personal layering tactics. So this is a pretty funny picture of me demonstrating the fact that you can actually wear all of your layers at once. Um, I'm even wearing somebody else's puffy jacket on the outside of my own puffy jacket. Um, but the point is, is make sure that all of your layers will fit together. Um, one thing that I've noticed is a lot of women do either get really cold easily or they get really hot easily, depending on their hormones or the, where they are in life. And so these are just different tactics for dealing with the personal thermal regulation. First of all, bras. It's preferable to find a bra, a sports bra that doesn't have any padding. Um, and that's because if you do sweat and that padding um, absorbs the sweat, it doesn't dry out very quickly. And if it doesn't dry out quickly, it's probably gonna keep you cold. So find a bra that doesn't have padding. Also sports bras that have wide straps can be really nice so that it doesn't chafe on your um, backpack straps or something like that. And then of course, 
it's better to have a sports bra than a bra that clasps in the back, um, just because that clasp can also interface with your backpack and be uncomfortable. Um, hoods, um, often in super cold environments, it's great to have a hat on underneath your helmet, but I actually climb oftentimes without a hat and that allows me to thermoregulate. Basically, I wear my hoods on the outside of my helmet, not underneath it. And that allows me to take those hoods off when I'm feeling hot and put them back on my helmet when I'm feeling cold. You, not, you won't always have an opportunity to take your helmet off um, to adjust that, um, especially if you're in a place where it's unsafe to do so. So keeping that uh, accessibility can be really helpful. Gloves are another great way to thermoregulate. We lose the most um, heat through our heads and our hands. And so I always like to keep two weights of gloves accessible um, so that I can either change to a warmer glove or change to a cooler glove if need be. And Allie will demonstrate how to do so here. So she has her harness on the outside of her jacket, which creates a little kangaroo pocket for her to store her gloves. And then she can put her other pair of gloves inside of there they're ready to change into if she needs to change that weight of glove again, and then she can put the new gloves on. And this just makes it so that your gloves are more accessible and you won't have to take your backpack off and stop the whole team if you do need to adjust that. Finally, your booty. Um, so women tend to have more body fat on their lower bodies um, and that does, is not vascular and so it's not as warm Warm. Unfortunately, we do lose a lot of heat through our butts, um, but there are really awesome puffy shorts, which Lyra is demonstrating here, or puffy skirts, which Marina is demonstrating here, um, that can help keep that warmth in on your butt. And what that does is if your tush is warm or your hips are warm, then it actually keeps your core warm and your extremities like your fingers and your toes warmer. And so that can be a really great way to thermoregulate as well. Finally, wool layers are a really awesome way, one, to just layer up, but also they can help prevent stink. A lot of the layers that we wear out there in the, in the mountains these days tend to be synthetic and they tend to stink a lot if we, if we sweat in them. Um, but fortunately, um, organic fabrics like wool can actually be less stinky. And so I like to wear like a wool t-shirt underneath or wool underwear underneath, and they're just less stinky overall. And finally, the last tip I have for layering is that if you are cold during the last 10 minutes before break, layer up. And if you were too warm during the last 10 minutes before break, then take a layer off going forward. Okay, so as women, some of us tend to be smaller statured than men um, and or we're just maybe not as strong or whatever. But I do have to say that overall women have more endurance than men. Um, and so there have been studies that shown that we actually are able to move for longer periods of time, which is awesome. But we tend to carry a higher percentage of our body weight, especially if we're smaller people. Um, so here's just a number of items that I found can quickly lighten your load. First of all, books. <laughs> it may be obvious, but I have seen people bring books out there. But if you want entertainment, bring electronic reading instead. You can bring a Kindle or a lot of people will load books or movies or podcasts onto their phone for entertainment out there in the mountains. You're probably carrying your phone anyways, so it's good to go. Next, your mug. Should you bring it? Well, yes, you should probably bring a mug. It's great for hot drinks out there, but this mug here is super heavy. And I actually recommend bringing a lighter transportable half liter Nalgene or water bottle instead. This allows you to, um, one, it's lighter, but two, it also allows you to have more water capacity if you need it. And it allows you to bring your hot drink on summit day, for example. So maybe you don't finish your coffee or your hot chocolate and you want to drink some of that as you're cruising up the mountain. That's a great way to do so. Whereas a mug is just going to spill. Should you express yourself out there with some jewelry? Uh, I like to say yes. You may have noticed Mary's awesome uh, earrings. She always is rocking some rad earrings out there. Um, I love to rock rad earrings out in the mountains. And that's great to wear jewelry, but know that you might lose it. Um, if you are wearing cool earrings or earrings that you care about, make sure they have back fasteners. Um, instead of wearing your expensive engagement ring, we use a rubber or 
silicone ring. There's some really cool designs out there these days. Um, and basically any jewelry that's expensive, I try to not bring out there with me. It can also just be like a nuisance if you're not used to it. Uh, should you bring a hairbrush? I usually say no, wear your braids instead um, if you have long hair so that you don't get tangled. Um, but that said, if you do need to bring a brush or if you're on a longer extended trip, it's nice to have a brush. Just bring one that's a travel size. Don't bring a full size brush. That's just too, he too heavy and too bulky. Should you bring makeup? I usually say no. Um, there's definitely some people who feel a lot more comfortable with makeup on and that's fine. But usually we're covered up in glacier glasses. We've got like sunscreen on our face and like other types of sun protection. And that's going to keep us looking uh, like we know what we're doing out there anyways. Um, <laughs> but if you do want um, some sort of tinted something on your face, a lot of sunscreen does come with tint these days, which is a really great um, item to bring. Should you bring sunscreen? Obviously, Yes, but bring the small one, maybe even just the rub on one, the one that has the bear uh, logo on it. Um, usually for like a three day trip or even honestly for like a week or two long trip, you're not actually going to need that much sunscreen out in the mountains. Um, often the only things, parts of our skin that are showing is our face and we do have to apply frequently, but you're not going to use a whole tube of sub sunscreen. I think I actually, this sport face sunscreen, the Neutrogena, I think I've used that all summer long last summer, the whole summer in the mountains. And I didn't even finish the whole tube. So you can bring a pretty small tube of sunscreen and it'll be perfectly sufficient for a single trip. Should you bring deodorant? I usually say no, although some people really need to bring it and feel much more comfortable with it. That said, most deodorants, especially if they have aluminum in them are actually meant to be washed off each day. So just keep that in mind. There's plenty of travel size deodorants out there as well though. Keep it small. Should you bring your toothbrush? Obviously, yes, but don't bring your electronic to toothbrush. Don't even bring your full size toothbrush. Bring a travel size or even take the little top off your electric toothbrush. And that can be much smaller, much less bulky, and much lighter. Of course, you should bring toothpaste, but bring the small toothpaste again. Finally, I just want to sh share with you. Um, I find that the place where people could probably downsize and wait the most is in their toiletries kit. Um, I found people bring a lot more than they really need. This right here is all I bring in my toiletries kit. It's really just toothbrush, toothpaste, hand sanitizer, and toilet paper. Okay, I admit, I also sometimes bring some comfort items. Um, and those comfort items for me are tweezers to pluck, <laughs> to pluck those errant like chin hairs or maybe like those errant unibrow hairs, uh, a mirror, to look at that, at my beautiful face. And then I usually like to bring a little um, like essential oil or something because it smells good. It makes me feel good out there. So that's my form of deodorant, but it's really tiny. My toiletries kit is really small. And again, like as women and, or as people who are smaller, we might be carrying such a large percentage of our body weight. And so it's really important to really try to pack down because we're still gonna have to carry the same stuff that anybody else on the trip is carrying. And somebody else might be a lot stronger they're carrying all their personal stuff and some group gear. So am I. So how can I downsize and keep my weight down as much as possible? Basically bring only what you need. And there's a really great blog post that one of our other guides posted on our website recently. Um, uh, Mary, you can put that one down there. It's a link to Lara, Lira's reducing pack weight. Um, and she just has a lot more tips on that as well. Finally, we're gonna talk about some training. So you can see I've got this super big pack here. I'm a pretty small person, but I can still carry that pack because I train really well. Um, so in order to train for your trip, uh, we'll talk about a few things. One, you're gonna to wanna to find some sort of base fi baseline fitness. Find some sort of daily movement, whether it's running, lifting, hiking, maybe a Zumba class, that just like is fun for you. And that'll keep you having baseline fitness. You're also gonna to wanna to find endurance. So I like to think about practicing what we do when we're moving on a trip in the mountains. And this is a great tool for you, even if you're uh, just going on your own personal trip, which is move for an hour at a time and then fuel. Um, and so you can do that in your training as well. Do an hour of movement, then fuel, then do another hour and then fuel and then do another hour. I found that oftentimes when people don't train enough, they like are super awesome. They're feeling fit. They're feeling great for the first hour. And then hour after hour, they start like slowing down and kind of bonking. And so if you practice moving and 
training for multiple hours at a time, you'll be much more prepared. Prepared. And then finally, it's really important to train sport for sport specifics. So one, you're going to want to carry a weighted pack. You're also going to want to carry that weighted pack uphill and downhill. And you're also going to want to move on uneven surfaces. In treadmills and Stairmasters are great for gaining the muscles that you need for uh, mountaineering. But there's also a lot of stabilizer muscles that you're not training. And so going on actual trails and moving on uneven surfaces is going to help those, those stabilizer muscles get ready. And then finally, you're going to want to use your own equipment. So use the boots that you plan to wear on the trip. Use the backpack that you plan to use. And that way you get used to those tools. And actually, our next webinar is on um, training for mountaineering. Um, one of our guides, who's also a certified conditioning and strength coach, is going to be leading that on January 30th. And so you can tune into that. There should be a link that Mary puts in there um, where you can register for that webinar. Um, yeah. And then the final thing I want to share is mental fortitude. This is a picture of Liz, who actually is the founder of the All In Ice Fest, which just happened in Uray this past weekend. Um, I put this picture because you can see her breath, which brings me to breathing. It can be a really great tool to reduce anxiety and to calm down your heart rate. I like to think of the box breath, which you may be familiar with, which is basically breathing in for four counts, holding for four counts, breathing out for four counts, and holding for four counts before breathing in again. Um, and you can do that in cycles. If holding your breath is hard to do while moving, you can also just slow down your breathing or breathe in for four and out for four. And this just reduces your fight or flight response and calms you down. Another way to reduce anxiety or just make you feel more excited about cruising up the mountain is playing some music. As always with music, do try to make sure that you only have one earbud in or something so that you can hear your partners on the mountain. Um, in, in case that there's some sort of communication that needs to happen. But I find that music tends to pump me up and helps me have more endurance over time. And then finally, practice and prepare. The more you prepare by training and practicing in the mountains, um, the more comfortable you're going to find yourself out there. And you're going to be able to just have a better time. And so whether you're a novice or you're, you've been in the mountains a bunch, the more you practice, you're going to have just, just to have a lot more ease out there. And with, if you are new, um, the best practice you can do is just to train. We do have tons of places where you can meet other women who are interested in mountain sports. And um, these are all of the women's trips that we have throughout the 2023. Um, the ones that are not starred are in partnership with She Jumps. Thank you, She Jumps. You guys are the best. Um, the trips that are in green are backcountry skiing specific and avalanche courses. The trips that are in purple are mountaineering specific courses. And the trips that are in blue are actually rock climbing and alpine climbing trips. Those are all awesome trips to take part in, especially if you want to meet other women who are interested in this stuff. Also, we have, these are photos of all of our female admin staff at Alpine Ascents. So if you do have questions about gear or about trips, more than likely you're going to encounter a woman on the phone. So don't be afraid to call and ask questions. Uh, all of these women are super experienced themselves in the mountains, even if they're not out there guiding, they are really rad. And of course, we also have more than 25 female guides at Alpine Ascents, which is a great ratio um, compared to the industry in general. Um, so if you do take a women's course, you're probably, you're going to definitely be with women guides. And more often than not, if you're in an open enrollment course or trip, you're probably going to be with a female guide as well. Um, so there's tons of really great women to learn from who have tons of experience in the mountains. And now it's time for some questions. So let's get started. All right, Brooke, thank you so much for that presentation. It was amazing. Yeah. Uh, we were having some issues with the webinar chat. Uh, Brooke and I were able to chat with each other, but not with you. So I will pop all of the links into the blog post when I upload this video, probably in the next day or two. So awesome. sorry about that. Okay, well, okay. And now on to some questions. Brooke's first question. What's the difference between a hard and soft ski bottle? Is it the plastic material? 
Yes. Um, so the difference between the hard and soft pea bottle is the soft pea bottle is made out of silicone, silicone, so it's floppy. Um, and it just doesn't really get over your layers as easily. And so the pea bottles that I suggest are the Freshette and the Shubi, which are firm, um, firm, hard plastic, essentially. And so they just can push over your layers more easily. Uh, next question, what do we got here? How do you find expedition gear for women? Most 8,000 meter parkas and boots only come in men's sizes. Yes, that is true. Most expedition gear, specifically 8,000 meter gear does only come in men's sizes, unfortunately. Um, for 8,000 meter boots, um, Mie and Loa are the companies that I've found to find boots that are small enough for women. Um, for uh summit parkas honestly just get a small size or an extra small, small size men's parka it doesn't need to be a women's size specifically um it's really you're gonna look like a michelin man no matter what <laughs> um but for um down suits those do kind of need to fit better i know that the north face has developed some women's down suits i don't know if they're on the market yet um and then also if you do need to get a down suit, um, sometimes I know that women who do this sort of stuff have shared their down suits because it's such a, a specific piece of equipment. And so if you do know, know other women who are doing this type of stuff, you can just be like, hey, do you happen to have this thing? And a lot of women are, are willing to help out. Awesome. Great answer. Next question. Do you have any tips? for packing out used pads and tampons to reduce the smell? So I would probably say just like put it in multiple layers of Ziploc bags. Um, that is actually one of the reason why I switched to a Diva cup um, is because I was just like so grossed out from the smell of like kind of dead meat from pa old pads and tampons. Um, but yeah, I guess if you just put um, multiple layers of plastic bags for you to pack it out, that's probably the best way to reduce the smell. Nice. What type of protective climate phone case do you recommend, if any? Ooh, for a phone case. I know that um, OtterBox makes some really good um, phone cases out there that are like kind of life proof. And I think there's also a brand called Life Proof that makes phone cases. Um, that said, uh, I know that like a lot of modern phones don't really have a problem with uh, with wetness or with cold, really. Um, I guess all phones have a problem with cold and phone cases won't help that. But uh, I haven't had a problem with just like a normal phone case out there in the mountains. Okay. Let's see, what else do we got? We have a lot of questions. What should we do next? How do you see folks managing wearing contact lenses or do people prefer to wear glasses? Ooh, well... Uh, so there are plenty of people who navigate in the mountains with glasses. Um, if you do wear glasses, it's really important to get prescription glacier glasses when you do need to have sun protection. Um, I know plenty of guides who wear glasses and make that work. The one problem that you could have is that it fogs up, which can be annoying. Um, I actually personally am, have terrible eyes and I actually got LASIK because I was so tired of carrying my contacts around. Um, but the main thing that I have is with, if you do have contacts um, and you're in a cold environment, it's important to sleep with your contact solution and your contacts themselves uh, next to your body so that they stay warm and they don't freeze. And then, of course, just make sure your hands are clean before you're putting them in and out. Excellent. Uh, we have a tip from Nicole in the Q&A because the chat function is disabled. Sorry about that. She recommends Pringle cans or poop tubes. For dog waste are also lightweight, lightweight and work great for blocking period smell. Great tip, oh, Nicole. Thanks so much. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, no, another question. Would you recommend owning both single and double mountaineering boots? And why? So it depends on what your goals are. Um, if you're going on guided trips, oftentimes in, and you need, if you're going on guided trips in the lower 48, and you need double boots, there often will be rentals available. Um, so single boots 
are probably the most versatile in a lot of areas in the lower 48. That said, if you're going on 6,000 meter and higher trips um, internationally or on in Alaska, it is nice to have your own double boot. Um, and especially if you're planning on doing trips like the seven summits, having your own double boot is going to just make you more comfortable in the boots that you're using and get your feet more used to them and be less likely to give you blisters. Okay. Another question, what do you use to wash your face in the backcountry? Oh, well, I usually just bring wet wipes. And so I'll either bring one or two wet wipes per day. And so I'll usually use a wet wipe on my face. And then I keep that wet wipe and just use it to wipe down in the Netherlands <laughs> uh, later. That said, um, you could just use one for your face and one for down there um, as well. Um, but just a wet wipe is just fine. All right. Uh, what other questions do we have? Did you say, so going back to clothing, did you say high waist? or lower waist pants are better? I prefer higher waisted pants. Um, I find that lower waisted pants can get like one that either fall down and high waisted pants, I just find uh, have a better interface with my um, harness and my backpacks uh, waist belt. So basically I want my pant waist to be higher than the actual, um, the actual waist belt on my harness. Nice. When expeditioning with men, do you find it better to rope up with women if they are there? And if there are no women to rope with, have you found roping up with men can be challenging because they may have a faster pace? How would you deal with that? Um, I would say on a guided trip, you shouldn't have to worry about the faster or slower pace. I find that men and women, it doesn't really matter what gender you are in terms of which pace you go. Um, it just really more depends on your fitness level. Um, and I would say it's important just to rope up with people that you feel comfortable with and people that you feel like you can communicate well with. Nice. Brooke, what do you make of the pants that has a zip that goes all the way back? I think it was like a GoFundMe. You know what I'm talking yeah, about? Yeah, I like, think I saw that. Yeah. Um, I would love to try those pants personally. Um, and I actually have a, a client who is doing a survey for women's bibs in terms of like dealing with um, outerwear pants and figuring out this female pants problem for going pee. Um, so hopefully she develops something cool too. Um, but those pair of pants, I haven't tried them. I bet they would be really convenient. They might be uncomfortable, I'm assuming, because there's a zip right there. Um, but the main thing is if you wear long underwear underneath your pants and you're wearing those pants, they're not going to be functional unless the long underwear also have a hole right there. So whoever is developing those kinds of pants, work on the long underwear part of the part of the equation. <laughs> Um, we have a comment in the Q&A, which has become the chat, I guess. Um, those pants are She Fly Apparel. Thank you very much, anonymous attendee, for letting us know the name. Uh, another question about gear. How do you prevent your sunglasses and glacier glasses from fogging up? So a lot of glacier glasses have the side um, panels, and there are certain glacier glasses that those are actually removable. Um, so I like to wear the jewel bow shields. Those are my favorite ones. And they actually have removable side panels. And so I take those off if I need a little bit more airflow, which helps prevent fogging. Additionally, if you pull your glasses like slightly down your nose, um, it kind of leaves more airflow rather than being directly up against your face. Nice. Um, another question. I don't know if you can answer this, but let's see. Can you Please tell us a little bit more about swelling. Are women at higher risk for edema or altitude sickness? Does that depend on the time of the month? I find that I swell more than male climbers at altitude, but I'm not sure if that is just me. I actually don't know the answer to that question. I do know that altitude um, sickness, there aren't really any no notable trends in terms of gender for who gets altitude sickness or not. 
In terms of edema, in terms of like edema in your hands and feet and stuff, that might be a hormonal thing. Um, but I actually don't know the answer. Not a problem. If I find any uh, medical clarity, I will pop it in the blog post when it goes up. Awesome. Let's see what other questions. We have a lot of questions. We won't be able to answer all of them, but we'll try. Um, here's another one. I've never been able to master the pee funnel. Is it okay to squat when roped up on a long expedition like Denali? Yes, a hundred percent. I actually try, I don't really use the pee funnel unless I'm going pee into a pee bottle. More usually the only time that I use a pee funnel while I'm roped up is when it's nasty weather out and I like taking my pants off would be really miserable. Um, but I would say in terms of trying to master it, just practice it more, um, and practice it in your bathroom with pants on and see if you can figure it out. Nice. Um, what do we have next? Um, we have a comment in the Q and a, not a paid endorsement. I have the she fly pants and they're very comfortable. I was oh, comfortable awesome. about the zipper placket, but the design is actually excellent. And they're comfortable under a harness. So we have um, a thumbs up for the sheep live pants. And then we have a question coming up next. How do you suggest adding weight to a pack for training? Um, so one of the best ways to add weight to pack for training is to put water in your pack or honestly, just pack it with the gear you plan to use on a trip. So, um, and then the pack weight, I find that water is great for adding weight, but it can sit in the pack in a really uncomfortable way. Um, and if you are going to have weight, weight in your pack, make sure you don't pour out the water at the top of a hill because you also need to practice walking downhill with weight on your back. Uh, in that same vein, which I hope bags of over. rice too, maybe bags what? of rice, bags of lentils. I don't know, stuff like that. <laughs> Um, and that's something you'd also be able to ask during the training for mountaineering webinar later this month, a little plug for that. Um, another quick training question, how many times a week would you recommend training with a weighted pack? Um, I think that Lyra will be better able to answer that question, but I would say one to two times a week is when I'm like in a bulking training plan for mountaineering. I'll usually go like once a week for a specific period of time. Um, if you think about marathon training, marathon training is usually like a few, like shorter, uh, shorter runs throughout the week. And on the weekend, you do like your big long run to train. And that's the way I'd think about mountaineering training as well. Like do all kinds of other types of training throughout the week. And on the weekend, when you have more time, you can do like a weighted pack hike. Nice. Um, <laughs> this is a funny one. What brand of earrings do you recommend? Um, I'm going to put a prop in for, I don't know where I got these, but I love them. Etsy has great earrings. Uh, Brooke, what would you say? <laughs> oh, I don't know. I just find earrings in cool places. Um, like I found this cool shop in uh, Fremont in Seattle and found some cool earrings this summer that I wore for a while. Um, one of our guards guides, Morgan McGonigal makes her own earrings out of all different types of things. So, you know, there's just a bunch of cool places to find fun earrings. Nice. Are there any ice climbing boots you recommend for women with small wide feet? Um, so, uh, the, the La Sportiva Nepal is a great ice climbing boot, but if you're looking for something a little bit warmer and you want like a double boot or a semi double boot, um, I have got, I have the Loa 6,000s, 6,000 meter boots. Um, and those are great boots that are warmer ice climbing boots. I know that there's other small fit, footed women who rep the Loa boots as well. Okay. This may be a silly question. There's no silly question. So, okay. Um, we would love to know what your strategy is for... I just lost it. Um, oh, for walking in packed steps in the snow and this wait. I would love to know what your strategy is when there are packed in steps in the snow and they feel like really big steps. I'm uh, 
Do you I was at three steps or do you try and take two steps each pack in step? Yeah, that's the question. Does that make sense? Great question. Um, I was actually talking about this with one of our male guides last night. He was like, yeah, uh, you should talk about steps. And I was like, oh, I should. Um, but basically if you can practice taking step ups to a, at least 18 inches, then you should be good to go. That said, if you're climbing with people who are taking way too big of steps, communicate with them, say, Hey, can you please take smaller steps? Um, your steps should be small enough even if you're a tall person, they should be small enough for everybody on your team to be able to easily take those steps. Um, sometimes the terrain doesn't allow for that and you will have to take a larger step. That's why being a step up to 18 inches um, and practicing that with step ups um, can be really helpful. Um, and then additionally, if the steps are still like really far apart and your partners or your guide is just like not listening to you and not making their steps small enough, you can, um, kick in between the steps. If it's a really big step that said, not all snow will accommodate, will make that will allow for that. So if the snow is really soft, um, sometimes the reason people are taking big steps is because if you take two small steps, the whole, like the steps are just going to collapse on themselves. And so sometimes you have to take big steps. Um, and in that case, it's just like a big harumph and you just gotta, just gotta go for it. <laughs> Uh, okay, I have another good question from where to go. There's a good question I'm about curious. what was that? There's a good question about hair. Oh yeah, I saw that. We'll do that one next. Um, I'm curious if when you are guiding, you have ever had someone question your abilities as a guide because you're a woman, and if so, how did you handle it? I don't think I've ever really had somebody completely outright question my abilities as a guide because I'm a woman. Um, but I do know that, you know, sometimes people make comments like, oh, you're such a little girl for such a little pack for such a big pack, or are you sure you can carry that? And I'm like, yes, I can carry it. And you know what the most funny thing though is, is that oftentimes the men who are making those types of comments, maybe we end up having to carry their pack later. <laughs> you never really know, but you know, like Generally, if you're making comments, you should just make sure that you can do it too. <laughs> um, All right. How do you suggest taking care of your hair? Do braids cause bad breakage? Do you bring dry shampoo or other products? Um, so the main thing that I do is I usually, right now I just got a new haircut. So I don't think I could braid my hair as easily now, but, but um, usually I just wear French braids and keep those in the whole time. And it actually creates this super cool little like crimped look when I take them out. Um, I don't find that it causes bad breakage. And what was the other part of that question? Um, other part of the question was, oh, I already filed it away. Uh, dry shampoo, dry shampoo. Dry shampoo. Um, dry shampoo is perfectly fine, but do you really want to carry a dry shampoo out there? I feel like it's kind of an unnecessary item to bring. Um, your, your hair is usually going to be like tied back or under a hat or a helmet most of the time. And so it's really not like a super important thing to have it be super clean or voluminous or anything like that. Um, when I'm on Denali, that's like, it ends up being like anywhere from like a 15 to 20 day trip. And I don't wash my hair that entire time. And I maybe rebraid it like three times. Um, and you just got to kind of deal. It's, it's kind of just part of the, part of the trip. Nice. Uh, what else? Let's see. We have a lot of training questions, so I, I might do those ones last if we have time, just because we have a training webinar coming up. Okay. Uh, let's see. Do you have any recommendations of comfortable brands of underwear for hiking? Yeah. So the, the brand that I like to wear, I wear, um, their like bikini style wool underwear from smart wool. Um, that said, I know that some women like to wear, uh, like booty shorts or even like boxer shorts. There's like, cause those don't ride up as easily. And then again, some women like to wear a thong out there, um, because that feels more comfortable to them. So I think it kind of just depends on what is the best, like most comfortable to you. Um, 
definitely the shorts I find really comfortable, but I really like wool underwear because one, it doesn't stink as much. Uh, it stays warm if it's wet and, um, it's also more hygienic. It just like allows you to breathe better than a synthetic pair of underwear. Nice. Um, okay. A couple more questions. Brooke, what's your favorite climb or a few of your favorite climbs? Oh, I would say probably one of the favorite climbs that I've done has been the North Ridge of Mount Stewart. It's just a really aesthetic mountain in the, in, um, in Washington. And it's more of a rock climb than, um, than a mountaineering climb. Um, I would say in terms of mountaineering, uh, I would say the Denali trip is amazing. It's just like a really cool experience to just be out there in such a broad, vast landscape. Um, and you know, you kind of just like lean into living in the mountains and it's just a really cool way to be out there. Awesome. Uh, okay. Let's try for three more. Um, since there are a ton of training questions, what I'm going to do is I'm going to save the questions and send them to Lyra, who's another one of our female guys, and she's amazing. She's the one running the webinar at the end of the month. So I'll just send these to her after this so they can be included in the training webinar. We're gonna do a real deep dive on training for mountaineering then. Um, okay, another, another question. Are there any backcountry ski setups that you recommend for women, especially women new to backcountry skiing? I would say fine. Um, generally ski setups that are going to be shorter are going to be easier to maneuver in the mountains. Um, I really like DPS skis. I have, I really like volley skis. Um, atomic skis are great. The black crows are a fan favorite for a lot of women out there. Um, I would say the best thing to do is to go to your local ski shop and ask them what they recommend they're going to be a lot more, um, they're going to be able to assess the type of skier that you are, how tall you are, how much you weigh and figure out what, and figure out what type of ski is going to be best for your specific goals. Um, because it really depends on whether you're skiing powder more often, or if you want an overall ski, or if you're going to be skiing, uh, icy crud more often. Um, it really just depends on your goals. Nice. Okay, um, let's try for three more. We have a two-part question on, well, there's two different questions. We'll have an all one big question um, on snacks. Any tips for snacks to bring for the Mount Rainier camp near three-day, or any tips for the three-day near climb? Well, first of all, here's one more plug. I am later, it's not gonna be a webinar, but I'm doing a video on snacks to bring for three-day trips, um, I believe. Uh, that's going to be released in March. So you can look out for that. But also my biggest recommendation is to bring snacks that you know you already enjoy. Um, and then also bring variety both in texture and in flavor. So I like to think about bringing, I like to bring chips. Chips are really nice because they have salty electrolytes in them. Um, they're lightweight, even if they're bulky and they're just super satisfying out there. I like to bring gummy bears or some sort of like chewy, sweet candy. Um, that can be really satisfying. Um, I like to bring chocolate and cookies because those are really filling and also satisfying out there. I love bringing blocks of cheese, uh, to just like non, sometimes you can bring crackers with them, but they crackers generally just like turn to dust and it's really hard to eat them, but just non on a block of cheese is great. Um, and then also I'm vegetarian, but meat sticks or anything like that can also be really satisfying. But I think more than anything, the thing that's going to keep you fueled while you're moving in the mountains is not so much protein, but sugars and carbs. Great answer. Um, there's another question about what types of plant-based snacks would you recommend while training and also on the mountain during the climb? I'm sure you'll bring that up in your training or in your food blog, but I am vegan. And some of my favorite snacks are the Trader Joe's Mochi Crisp. They're super delicious. Um, Tempura Seaweed Crisp. And if it's a longer trip where I do need some fat and protein, uh, sort of the savory and the sweet almond from Trader Joe's. Basically, I go to Trader Joe's and just grab everything. <laughs> <That's> vegan. I <laughs> agree with that. 
There's also, um, there's also a lot of really yummy vegan jerkies out there that I find really satisfying. Um, so that's another great snack to have. Yeah. There's a mushroom vegan jerky, which is really good. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. For real, two more questions. Um, what brand of pants do you suggest for smaller women? Oh, that is a great question. I actually, so I'm five, three and like 130 ish pounds. So I'm not like, like super skinny person, but I'm a short person. And I found that most brands, like most size, small brands will fit me. Um, if you're super skinny, uh, I, I actually, I think you should probably just go try, just try a bunch of pants on. I actually don't know the answer. Um, rab runs really big. Don't get rab pants. If you're super skinny, um, they're just, they run really big European brands are going to run slightly smaller. So if you, uh, I know Arcteryx runs pretty small. Ortovox runs pretty small. I think Dinafit has some pretty small sizes as well. Um, but basically European brands are going to be, um, smaller in general. Nice. Okay. Um, just a couple more questions. Uh, we have a comment in the Q and A, which is on the chat, old school snacks. I use Snickers. Yes. We love Snickers. They're delicious. Um, a quick question. Um, will, will there be a replay of the webinar available? Yes, there will be. I'll be putting it on the blog, our Alpha blog, in a couple of days. So look out for that. Um, we have a comment from Tara Fraga, who is our program coordinator and also an extremely talented trail runner. She has a prop for Dina Fit. It's great for smaller size pants. So thank you for that, Tara. Um, one couple more questions. How do you deal with being cold while camping in the winter? I have the best down sleeping bag. Wait, I have, I have a great down sleeping bag, several base layers, but I was still cold. Any tips? Um, so if you do go on a guided trip, part of what your guides will talk about is how to sleep warm. Um, but some tips are, uh, move around before you go to sleep, make sure your body is actually warm. When you go to bed, um, sleeping bags actually don't heat you up, but they mean they they act more like a thermos. So if you're warm getting in, it'll stay warm. Um, if you have too many clothes inside your sleeping bag, it'll actually smush the loft of the sleeping bag and the sleeping bag won't do that great of a job keeping you warm. Additionally, you're going to want to find good R value in the pads of your sleeping pads. So if you're only having a blow up pad, it probably is just not warm enough. Um, we always bring a Z light or a foam pad and a, and a blow up pad to sleep in the winter because it insulates you better from the snow. Um, additionally, you can put the foam pad on top of the blow up pad to better insulate your body. Um, because you can imagine where you're sleeping, where your body is pressing down on the sleeping bag, there's no insulation there. And so your, your pads are actually doing that part of the insulation. If you wake up cold, you can always eat something to keep yourself warm or drink something and, um, go pee. If you need to go pee, move around in your sleeping bag to get yourself warm again and heat up that bag. There's a lot of different things you can do. Cool. Thanks for us. Okay. The final question of the webinar is going to be, do you bring hand warmers? Do I bring hand warmers? Most of the time I do not. On um, higher mountains and uh, colder, uh, when the weather is going to be colder, I do. Um, so for example, on Denali, I do bring hand warmers. I rarely use them though or I have really used them. I use them on like really cold nights. I do bring hand warmers when I go ice climbing. I actually used them recently. I had an accident and the hand warmers came in very handy to keep the victim warm. Um, and so especially if you're not moving, hand, hand warmers can be really helpful. And hand warmers can be really helpful also for sleeping warm, especially if your extremities get cold. Um, I found that to be very helpful. Uh, but if you have rain odds or some sort of uh, circulation problem, hand warmers are uh, an essential. Nice. Okay, that was the final question. Uh, a comment in the Q&A, aka the chat, um, for a hot Nalgene in the sleeping bed to help keep you warm. Great tip. Yes, so awesome. Yes.
Um, you can well, pee in your pee bottle and your pee bottle's warm. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> but you're the guy, not me. You don't um, want it to leak. That would be a bad deal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, thank you everyone, everyone for coming to this webinar, the first winter webinar in our um, winter webinar series. Uh, Brooke, thank you so much. I learned a ton. It was just an amazing presentation. Like I said, uh, this webinar will be recorded. So if you is being recorded. So if you didn't take notes, don't worry about it. It'll be in the blog, along with all the links that I couldn't put in the chat. Um, I see there's still a lot of gear questions in the gear queue. Our gear manager at Alpine Essence, and actually most of our gear staff are all women. So definitely feel free to email them at gear at alpineessence.com or just give them a call and they will answer all of your gear questions. Um, I'm gonna take all of these training questions and make sure they get included in our training webinar later on this month. Um, what other housekeeping notes? Um, at the end of this webinar, there will be a survey where we ask for other webinar topics that you're interested in learning about. So if you, have, you wanna learn more about snacks or a certain climb, let us know and we'll try and have a webinar about it. Um, any final words from you, Brooke? I was just going to say, I know that there are some questions that we didn't get answered. Um, a lot of those questions either can be answered in that training webinar that Mary mentioned on January 30th. And also, if you do come on a guided trip with us, um, all of our guides are super knowledgeable and super um, willing to help you learn and find success out there in the mountains. So like, for example, about getting good at the rest step or sleeping warm or, you know, getting prepared in other ways. Um, you can always ask your guide during your trip or call our office staff and they're always willing to help you out as well. Awesome. Well, thank you all very much, everyone. And look for this recording on the blog in a couple of days. Bye. Thank you guys. <laughs>